let's look a little bit more closely at how cannabis labels um, are created. How are those percent THC and CBD actually uh, determined. Uh, so we're going to look at analyzing cannabis. Um, and there is a state law that regulates quality assurance and control of cannabis products. It's the WAC number 314-55-102. There's a link in the reading um, assignment if you are interested in looking at it in more detail. And what it really regulates is what needs to be tested and what are safe standards for cannabis products uh, before they are given to consumers. And so in general, the process is gonna go through a few steps. You will take your cannabis product and you will have to prepare the sample. Um, that sample preparation piece involves uh, grinding up the material if it's a flower, extracting it, and then um, diluting it into an appropriate concentration for performing uh, different types of tests. And unfortunately, there's not just like one type of test or method that allows us to really look at everything we're interested in for a cannabis product to know if it is safe and what its potency is. Uh, so unfortunately, there's a, a a number of different ways to do a lot of these tests and also um, more or less incentive to spend the money and time to do some of them. Uh, so first off, let's look at what are the most common ways that people determine the uh, amount of cannabinoids that are present in a sample. Uh, so the kind of most common method is H. PLC. This is high performance liquid chromatography. Another one that is used significantly is gas chromatography. These two we will spend more time in detail talking about. Uh, and we will we'll focus on chromatography in general because it's a fantastic tool for separating mixtures, which is exactly the challenge of figuring out what is in a cannabis plant. There's a ton of things in there. And so actually figuring out everything in there requires separating out a lot of different compounds. So That'll be our focus. Now, cannabinoids are, you know, of a pretty big, um, you know, they they are mostly nonpolar. Uh, our terpenes, though, are typically smaller and nonpolar, um, and they are very volatile. And so, if we just leave them out exposed to light, they will evaporate. Um, and so, they're less stable than our cannabinoids. And so, the HPLC technique is not going to work great for them. Instead, GC gas chromatography is the best option for analyzing the terpenes present in a sample. All right. So these are usually the things people are interested in, in terms of selecting exactly which product they want to buy. The other things I'm going to describe are things that everyone assumes are just in very low levels. Um, and I realized while I'm looking at this, I forgot one. Residual solvent. This is less applicable to flowers, but very applicable to um, cannabis concentrate products. Um, so residual solvent is something that is also very volatile. So gas chromatography is going to be the best way to determine if you have any butane around or carbon dioxide or ethanol. Um the next one that's really important is detecting the presence of pesticides, which we would not want to ingest at all. And so pesticides are typically determined by um, looking at liquid chromatography or gas chromatography paired with something called mass spectroscopy. Mass, <laughs> mass spectroscopy is a really powerful tool used to help identify compounds um, in chemistry in general and in the health industry. And we'll spend less time focusing on it because um, there's only so much time in a week. Uh, it's really interesting though, but um, the, we'll, we'll give a brief overview. So this is going to be typically liquid chromatography paired with mass spectroscopy or gas chromatography paired with mass spectroscopy. 
Uh, the next one that we want to make sure uh, that that consumers need to be protected from are high levels of heavy metals. Um, and so to do these tests, uh, we use something, it's, it's a form of mass spectroscopy, but it ionizes, um, it's ion couple, cup, ionized couple plasma mass spectroscopy. It's a bit much, um, for a mouthful of words to say. Um, and so this is a method that we can use to ionize, um, any heavy metals and detect them, um. The other one that's really important is making sure the microbial content of the plant is low enough that it's safe for people to consume. Uh, 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 toxin myotoxins are also sometimes produced. Um, and so these we need to check for as well. And there are, um, for myotoxins, there are some testing strips that can be easily used. And for microbes, there's a couple options. Um, either we can use, uh, I'm going to abbreviate this TCM, but it just means traditional culture methods. And so this is kind of getting into the biology side of things where you would culture different microbes uh, to see if they are present. Um, or you could do a, a PCR, which is a quantitative polymerase chain reaction. Kind of like a PCR test when you get a COVID test. Um, so these are going to be biology techniques. Uh, so we won't focus on them, but that's how you would test for microbes. And it's, uh, all of these things are required. Well, the, I don't believe the terpenes are required, but testing for pesticides, residual solvent, heavy metals, microbes, and myotoxins are required within the state to make sure that all these products are safe for people to inhale or ingest. So one of the kind of major focuses um, when we think about testing is uh, making sure it's consistent. So I'll take a moment to talk about standardization and cannabis analysis. Um, and this is a this is a current uh, and pressing challenge for the industry as a whole. Uh, theory, any lab in the state would receive a product and get pretty close to the same results for cannabinoid content or the number of micro, like the microbe content in the sample. But unfortunately, we don't have a standard set of practices for how the testing takes place. We have standards for what the products need to meet. And then there's also kind of market pressure for the standards as well. But we, we don't have a standardized set of how the samples should be prepared and uh, which methods of detecting are preferable or required. <laughs> um, and so like testing for cannabinoids, you can use high performance liquid chromatography or you could use gas chromatography. You can also use UV vis spectroscopy and uh, nuclear magnetic resonance. There's a lot of esoteric ways to do it. Um, and they will produce slightly different results. But I think where the greatest variation is really seen is in standard preparation. And this can have a huge impact on what is being uh, read for the potency of a product. So when you're preparing these samples, um, and we're going to think about this from the perspective of just a, a cannabis flower, that flower needs to be ground up and then the compounds extracted from it. And so we've been talking about this extraction process to make cannabis concentrates, but this is also the process that you would do to figure out what exactly is in that plant. The grinding of the flower can happen in a few different ways, and it is going to have an impact on how much of the compounds are able to be extracted from it. And so as the surface area of the particles increases, so how big they are, then we'll be able to extract more compounds. And so some labs are gonna use a mortar and pestle to really grind it up. Others are just going to use a mechanical grinder. And the amount of time that this step takes and also how fine the grain is
can have a huge impact on the test results. And there isn't a standard practice here. It isn't use this type of grinder for this amount of time or use a mortar and pestle for this amount of time. And so we can have different labs have different levels of fineness to the grains of the flour that have been produced, which will affect your end results. Once you're extracting the compounds too, there's a lot that can uh, be different from solvent choice that'll produce, extract more or less of different types of compounds. The amount of time that the extraction has to take place. The temperature and also the volume of the solvent that's actually used. Some may use only a milliliter, some may use more and then concentrate it down. Uh, and so all of these will have really dramatic effects. And we can even say like how much effort was put into extracting absolutely everything you can out of the plant, or was it just extracted for a short period of time with less solvent? And so honestly, there isn't a better or worse, like of the different varieties of strategies here, there's not one that's bad or good. Uh, it's really just inconsistent and there's a lot of opportunity for variation. And so standardizing within cannabis analysis would require a specific set procedure for sample preparation that included uh, a method for grinding that would reproduce the same particle size, uh, a solvent choice that would be used by all labs, a time for the extraction and an amount and volume of solvent and a temperature, and uh, the number of iterations that the plant was extracted. And if those were consistent across labs, then they would all be starting with the same sample. And if they had the same sample, then we would expect the variation that occurs between choosing different methods to be much smaller than the overall variation we can see for the process as a whole. And so there are steps that can be taken within the industry and through regulation to try to create a more consistent um a more consistent result for the question of like, what is in a plant? I'm gonna show you something interesting. So the Washington Liquor and Cannabis Control Board or what it's called, uh, audits um, labs that are testing cannabis um, for potency and to make sure it's safe for consumers that it meets the regulations set forth by state law. And interestingly enough, consumer preference for cannabis flower with a uh, greater than 20% THC level has really incentivized bias within the analysis process or industry within for cannabis. And you can see this starkly uh, in some data that was produced in a paper that I have linked on our Canvas page, um, where they're looking at just taking the labs in Washington and looking at the flowers they're, they're analyzing and the results and just like looking at a distribution of the results that they produce over a year. And, um, the comparison is interesting, but I pulled out just one small piece from the article that I wanted to share. And it's a comparison between suspended labs in Washington. So labs that had suspicious or concerning lab results over a period of time and actually lost their ability to um, test cannabis plants. And so the, the, the state did an audit, found uh, evidence that it was... Um, biased or there was a problem and so took away their certification or suspended the lab from doing the work unless they met certain outcomes. Um, and so if we just compare that to one of the larger labs that is testing cannabis in the state of Washington, just to kind of have a large sample size, um, you can see what that something interesting happens at 
20% THC. So we have in our suspended labs, very few of our samples that came through were below 20%. And the majority of them were above it. But the piece that's really drawing my attention is this discontinuity between 19% and 20%. There is a dramatic jump between 19% and 20% here. Uh, We would expect a curve over so many samples that would have some sort of normal distribution like this, which you can kind of see here in the largest Washington lab, right? Like there's a distribution that looks continuous especially right here between 19 and 20%. There isn't a large shift or jump or change at any point. It's following a a, a predictable pattern. Also, a a large percent of the sampled products are below that 20% mark, right? So you're seeing consistent behavior and you're seeing dramatically different behavior than the suspended labs, which don't have consistency there. Their graph goes like this and then it suddenly jumps up and then continues the distribution curve. Um, And so this is mathematically improbable for a large set of samples. And this is looking at lots of them. Uh, And so, so, so there is uh, a very real effect of consumer preference on uh, lab results and biasing lab results. And so this is why the audit process exists. So that way labs um, that have kind of shifted their results um, or are producing statistically unlikely results um, can be called out for acting unethically and not be able to test products um, or suspend their ability to have them. So uh, the other problem with this is it's it's not just about THC content and just inflating the THC content. Also, a lot of these suspended labs were accused of not failing samples with high microbe content. And so that meant that they had a suspiciously low number of samples that were able to, or a suspiciously high number of samples that were able to pass the microbe test or standard. Um, one that didn't fit the rest of the data for plants across the state. Uh, and so that was the other really big tip off. And I have a link in the optional readings to some of the articles that came out around the time that was one of the larger labs in the state was suspended for inflating THC contents and for not failing samples with high microbe levels. 